Good morning, everyone. Um, we're now embarking on hearing number 30 of the 169th period of sessions in this room, which is our third hearing this morning. Um, this hearing is the, about the demarcation and titling of indigenous lands in the Caribbean. And it was requested by civil society organizations who will identify themselves when they speak. The objective of the hearing is that the MLA, APA, and VIDS collectively propose a th thematic hearing to discuss the status of land, demarcation, and titling, including a comparative assessment of good practices and challenges of indigenous lands throughout the Cal Caribbean using Belize, Guyana, and Suriname as case studies. The organizations assert that such a thematic hearing will provide a useful forum for which, from which to assess the status of indigenous land rights in the Caribbean region in accordance with the mandate of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights and its strategic plan 2017 to 2021. Specifically, its strategic objective three, program 10, which aims to increase active participation of stakeholders in the Caribbean in the work of the Inter-American Commission. I am really happy that you have requested this hearing about time. <laughs> Thank you very much. You will have 20 minutes. Ding, ding is here. Ding, ding. Ding, ding is here. Oh. I must recognize the dean of this August institution who is here That's present. And? He's the Ecuador of the United Nations on Indigenous. Oh. <laughs> I'm yes, of course, <laughs> of course. And, and of course, with your experience in the United Nations, perhaps you can assist us. I would not, we would, not be adverse, we would not be adverse for you to come and sit with us. Yes, please. Yes, civil society, civil society, you would have 20 minutes for your in, um, presentation, and um, then we might see how much time we have for your closing statement. And of course, Dean, we will give you time to make a statement in this matter. Thank you very much for being here. With that, let us commence, please. And identify yourselves when you speak. No, don't, you don't have to, okay. just speak. All right. A uh, pleasant good morning to um, everyone here, commissioners um, and Professor Anaya. It's wonderful to see you, um, members of the indigenous community. Um, I'd like to begin by introducing myself. My name is Christina Koch. I am the spokesperson for the Maya Leaders Alliance and the Toledo Alcaldes Association. Um, also joining me is my colleague, uh, Pablo Miss, who is the program director for both of these organizations. Um, along with Mr. Louis Buzwani, who is a colleague from Suriname. You will hear from him as a second speaker. Mm -hmm. The Maya Leaders Alliance and the Toledo Alcaldes Association has been working on behalf of the Maya people since the mid-1990s and have been the plaintiffs in various Maya land rights cases which have collectively, um, which the communities have collectively affirmed as their chosen representatives uh, from the Maya people in southern Belize. We're also joined today by the Association of Indigenous Village Leaders in Suriname, uh, who will present next. And unfortunately, the Am Amerindian People's Association from Guyana were unable to attend. We extend our sincere apology for this. Um, and now I'd like to take the opportunity to um, thank the commission um, for allowing us the forum and the space to share our experiences and our challenges uh, with respect to the implementation of um, undoubtedly a precedent-setting case in the Caribbean. To begin, I'd like to provide a very brief um, background for context on how we have arrived now to the Caribbean Court of Justice decision and consent order. You will remember that the Maya people in the mid-1990s uh, petitioned the Inter-American Commission, uh, which led to a report in 2004, which recognized and affirmed Maya customary land rights. Um, that 
became a very important legal precedence, which has been referenced in uh, the cases that came after in the domestic courts of Belize. Uh, perhaps the two that we uh, are looking at today is the 2007 and 2010 um, Maya land rights case in the Supreme Court of Belize where uh, the courts found in favor of the Maya people and again affirmed our rights to lands and resources in southern Belize. Following that was uh, the judgment of the, of the Court of Appeals in 2013 and then finally the uh, 2015 consent order uh, before the uh, Caribbean Court of Justice. All of these cases have, for the, for all of these cases have upheld the substance of the Inter-American Commission report. And perhaps just to give a very brief, um, a very brief description of what the, what resulted from these cases. Very briefly, uh, these cases have affirmed and that Maya customer land tenure exists in the Maya villages, giving rise to collective and individual property rights. It also ordered the government to adopt affirmative measures to identify and protect these rights in consultation with the Maya people. So where are we now? We are at the implementation phase of this very important uh, land rights decision. And for a just for a brief status of this implementation, the Caribbean Court of Justice has retained supervision and there continues to be hearings and in-camera meetings before the Caribbean Court of Justice three years uh, after the order was, was issued. These hearings have addressed issues including where the government of Belize have not been meeting court-ordered deadlines or obligations and the court is becoming increasingly concerned with the government perhaps flouting the rule of law. Following the theme of this hearing, I would like to now focus my presentation specifically on concrete hindrances uh, inhibiting demarcation and titling and how this threatens indigenous human rights in the Caribbean. Perhaps one of the biggest challenge that we find is the difference in, in interpretation between the government of Belize and the Maya people, as well as international community. The government argues that the consent order is only an agreement and that it is not binding. The government also believes that demarcation and titling are not required by this order. For instance, there continues to be leases, incursions, and concessions granted by the government, and pending cases before the Supreme Court of Belize in relation to these kinds of violations. So even while indigenous communities receive successful court orders recognizing land rights, state governments may still choose to ignore the letter and the spirit of these orders. A second major challenge includes a difference in approach to demarcation and titling. The Maya people understand that the best way to implement the Caribbean Court of Justice order is to identify and protect their rights by demarcating the general boundary around Maya villages and to allow for the Maya people themselves to determine the boundaries between villages in accordance with their traditional governance and decision-making systems. The government of Belize, however, believes that it should control demarcation around each Maya village using Western standards of property ownership, not in alignment with Maya land practices, or the Caribbean Court of Justice judgment and order. For instance, the government wants to use actual physical housing as a measure of land use, which is contrary to the rotating land system identified as legitimate by the Caribbean Court of Justice. The difference in approach could risk protection of Maya land stewardship practices and property ownership, dismantling the order to a point where the collective existence of our 39 Maya villages, organized under customary governance institutions, could be eroded. <coughs> this is a pattern where the government continues to undermine the true nature of the affirmed rights by exploiting any potential gray area. A third challenge for implementation and demarcation of Maya land rights has been that 
the government of Belize is actively trying to persuade individual Maya families to purchase leases from the government for their land so that it is no longer collectively owned by the villages. While this tactic is not legally potent because this Caribbean Court of Justice affirmed that leases cannot extinguish Maya land rights, it is still a barrier because it threatens the integrity of Maya governance and community cohesion. In fact, I might go further to say that it is not only a barrier, but it's also undermining and in direct opposition to the order of the Caribbean Court of Justice. One could only see this again as floating the rule of law. This approach falls within a very direct pattern of government using their power to create dissonance within indigenous communities who challenge them. The government has issued this tactic from the very beginning. You will remember they challenged the authority and standing of the Maya communities to bring these cases forward, even criminalizing advocates for Maya rights, ultimately trying to restrict the technical and legal capacity of the Maya communities, a right that is afforded to them. I am sure Suriname will present on these issues as well and will show how these patterns are very similar within the Caribbean of ways in which the state tries to divide indigenous communities. Finally, the government attempts to work with everyone else except the Maya chosen representatives. The government, for instance, has been working with NGOs, individuals, and other ethnic groups that do not comprehensively represent the interests and will of the Maya people in accordance with Maya governance systems to spearhead processes on behalf of the Maya people. Yet, the Maya people are the rights holders whom the order directly affects. One example of this includes the government working with NGOs to get funding on behalf of the Maya people for boundary demarcation, even though the Maya people are not directly involved. Currently, a work plan is being developed not satisfactorily in involving the Maya people. And this work plan does not include a process for demarcation. For us, the Maya people of Southern Belize, this continues to be an attempt of the government co-opting the indigenous governance bodies so that the indigenous Maya communities are not the ones defining their territories. Indigenous land rights and governance systems are intricately related. And any threats to governance ultimately threatens the integrity of our land base. Now to speak more uh, positively on the good practices, because there have been some good practices. Maya people have been taking ownership over the demarcation process. There have been a lot of good work done. Time will not allow for us to talk about all of them, but we'd like to focus specifically on two of our efforts. We developed the Maya consultation framework which provides the minimum standards for how to go about doing demarcation, boundary demarcation, uh, in consultation with the Maya people. The Maya people know their land better than anyone else and have developed the Maya boundary harmonization process, which lays out steps building upon Maya customary processes to demarcate village boundaries. The Maya people have learned from the experience of other indigenous communities fighting for their rights within the Caribbean and throughout the world. It is important to identify state patterns limiting indigenous rights in order to better combat them. The indigenous communities within the Caribbean region have fought hard for the recognition of their legal and constitutional rights, and their experiences have shed light on the challenges for the next level of self-determination, demarcation and titling of indigenous lands. It is the hope of the Maya people that this hearing brings greater awareness throughout the Caribbean region and beyond of the challenges of demarcation and titling indigenous lands so that we may all learn and move forward in a better way. We welcome the commission to visit the Caribbean region to better understand the issues on the ground 
and we personally believe that a visit to Belize would bring needed awareness and attention to the fight for the demarcation of Maya lands in southern Belize. I will, this is where I conclude my presentation. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Good morning from my side. I would like to begin by also thanking the commissioners, their staff, uh, Professor James Anaya, and the university for allowing us to be here today. Before you start, perhaps I should indicate that 12 and a half minutes have been used up. <laughs> okay. My name is Louis Biswana. I represent the indigenous village leaders of Suriname. Among with my sisters and brothers from Belize, I'm here to speak today about recent developments with demarcating and titling indigenous lands in the Caribbean. While I will talk frequently about the specific struggle of my people, I hope that these exper experiences can help inform the Commission and other indigenous communities in the Caribbean some of the obstacles my, that might be faced <clears throat> and some of the best practices necessary to complete the difficult task of protecting indigenous lands. Indigenous people are the original first inhabitants of the Americas. Our first struggle for our lands began with the arrival of the European settlers in our territory. After the independence of Suriname in 1975, many of our communities, in particular the lower Marawena area, held a protest march in 1976, during which we walked on foot from our border town, Albina, to the main town of Paramaribo for four days. It's about 150 kilometers long and giving the government a petition saying that we want the legal recognition of our lands. The government then promised that they would work on it, but nothing was done for us. Shortly after the internal war and back in 1986 till 1992, the Association of Indigenous Village Leaders in Suriname, the FITS, was established, consisting of the leadership of all 52 indigenous villages in Suriname. The major groups are the Kalinya or Karaib, and the Lokono and Arawak in the coastal area. And in the south, we have the Chirio and the Wayana. The indigenous peoples are approximately 4% of the total population of Suriname. FITS was established with the main objective being the legal recognition of the land rights and traditional authority structures of the indigenous peoples. Through trainings, village meetings, and community-based researches, the indigenous communities are made aware of, this, of their, their rights. In 1996, the decision was taken by the second conference of the FITS to pursue a collective land claim for the entire indigenous territory in Marawena. Most villages indicated that they knew their boundaries of their lands, but do not have that on a map. It was therefore decided to map our territory and the indigenous peoples and secure this. This was also important as evidence for the eventual court case. We have consulted other elderly people, fishermen, hunters, gatherers of forest fruits and medicinal plants, and residents of the eight villages of our area. We have also done several community-based researches of the history of our people, also as evidence of our century-old use and knowledge of our territory. We spent a year with experienced hunters and forest connoisseurs in the forest and made use of the global positioning, positioning system to point out the different points. And in the year 2000, we have produced our first demarcation map. We have uh, been offering this map to various governments, agencies, and also various uh, foreign ambassadors but so far without good results. In 2003, the eight indigenous villages in the lower Marawena consist of two Arawak or Lokono villages and six Kalinya or Karaib villages joined together and established the claim. After decades of meetings and attempts to resolve the issue through dialogue and many official complaints to the, to the government, none of which led to useful answers to fits and the claim and the indigenous community decided to file an official complaint in order to start a lawsuit against the state of Suriname in front of the regional body, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. 
This was one of the only ways that was left to us to obtain legal recognition of our rights. As, known, as is known, the collective rights of indigenous and tribal people in Suriname are not legally recognized, including the rights to the land they have been living and using for centuries. According to Surinamese legislation, all land, including on ter traditional lands, is regarded as domain ground because no formal government title has been issued. Like my brothers and sisters in Belize, it is therefore repeatedly the case that lands in indigenous and or Maroons area are issued to individuals or companies. Also, all kinds of concessions or license for extractive industries are issued still today as I speak here, including mining and logging, which destroys and pollutes our environment. So in, six, in 16 February 2007, a lawsuit was filed by the FITS and the CLIM with legal support from the Forest People Program. The case was found admissible and in 2014 conveyed from the Commission to the Inter-American Court. A hearing was held in February 2015 and after on-the-spot orientation of the court in Suriname in August 2015, a decision was made in November 2015. The court determined that the state has indeed violated the rights of the indigenous peoples and was ordered to delimit and demarcate the traditional territory of the members of Kalyan and Lokono peoples, as well as grant them collective title to history, to the territory and ensure their effective use and enjoyment thereof, taking into account the rights of other tribal peoples in the area. This decision was published in uh, January 2016. So the last deadline for all the measures of the court is 28 February 2019. So however, our struggle for implementation of the order has been similar to our Maya colleagues. In the almost three years since the judgment have been not much implementation of measures, only the translation of the summary. Not even the process expenses have been paid and nothing of the real legislative and protection measures have been taken. As it stands now, we work, however, on a roadmap created by members of the government and indigenous peoples, and the starting date that is now, October 1st. In this roadmap process, a draft law regarding collective land rights should be finalized within 12 months. As we move forward with this roadmap, map with the government, we hope that the hearing will help advise this, that pro process. We as indigenous people face a lot of obstacles. After so many promises from the state of Suriname and land rights, our land rights and other rights are still not legally recognized. Although the government has signed several international treaties and declarations as well as the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, the government is trying all kinds of delay tactics, tactics not to legal, legally recognize our rights. At this very moment, the government agents are trying to convince village leaders to leave the fits and are trying to divide us to make us politically weaker. We have a lot of work to do on awareness for our communities, but also the broader society who is not aware of our rights. And I have not even spoken about the big gaps, development opportunities for our villages. We are happy to learn that the experience of my Maya brothers and sisters and we hope that our experiences in Suriname can contribute to better and best practices for protecting our lands throughout the <coughs> demarcation and titling process. We also hope that the Commission can make a contribution to the full implementation of the court judge judgment of 2015. I thank you on behalf of the indigenous communities of Suriname. Thank you very much. Um, it is now um, a great pleasure to invite the Dean of the University of Colorado in Boulder, um, James Anaya, to make some comments and assist us in this matter. Thank, thank you, Ma Madam President. This uh, indeed uh, is an un unexpected honor, uh, but I'm very happy <laughs> Uh, to, and welcome the, the opportunity <laughs> to participate and sit on the panel with, uh, of, of the commission. Um, I think at the outset what is quite stark uh, 
about this hearing is the absence of the government's concerned. And I think that absence in many ways or in a fundamental way goes to the heart of the problem. Um, what we've heard um, from the representatives of indigenous peoples in the region uh, is about decisions by judicial bodies, uh, both within the American system and the domestic legal systems concerned, affirming, legally affirming their land rights. So we're not a, in a situation where uh, at least these particular representatives of indigenous peoples are uh, asking for rights that have not been recognized, but are simply calling upon uh, the government's concern to implement decisions, legally binding decisions, as I understand it, in the case of Suriname as well, mm -hmm. um, that the government is uh, bound uh, by law to uh, implement. Um, and so I think it's important to recognize that in, in large part we're, we are talking about not just a matter of indigenous rights, but a ma matter of rule of law. Mm -hmm. um, there, we're faced with a situation in which governments simply are not following uh, binding legally decisions in the case of Belize, uh, decisions by the highest appellate court in the region, which uh, by virtue of the domestic legal arrangement in Belize is binding upon the government, and the government does not contest that, it simply ignores it, it seems. Um, I guess the question then is what can be done? Uh, the, the, the guidelines are already there in the multiple decisions by the various institutions and courts that have, have been already intervened in these situations. Um, and so I don't think it's a matter of setting forth more guidelines. It's a matter of actually somehow um, catalyzing uh, or motivating implementation. Uh, so I, I, for one, would like to hear from uh, the representatives of the indigenous peoples concerned, you know, what, what kind of, of what, what can be done to, uh, to catalyze or motivate that implementation. Um, the representative of the Maya uh, people in Belize mentioned a visit by the commission. I'd like to, it would be interesting to know how they think, uh, how you think a visit would actually be helpful and useful. And as for the situation in Suriname, I mean, what, what kind of action um, or motivation could be provided? For the for the government to pressure it into implementation. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you very very much. Um, your intervention does focus um, several issues. Um, I now okay. yeah. I now invite Commissioner Antonia to intervene. Um, thank you. I'm going to talk in Spanglish, okay? Oh yes. <laughs> okay. Um, first of all, um, thank you, Margaret. And um, for me, it's an honor to have. James and I are on the table, actually. Um, me too. Yes. <laughs> me too. Yeah, but as a, as a, as a reporter too. that sees um, um, the human rights to indigenous people, you know, well, mm -hmm. you know better than me the importance mm -hmm. of James and I on those mm -hmm. issues. So I think mm -hmm. it's very important to have him here. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, as the Dean said, um, I think the, the inter-American standards relating to, to indigenous people's rights to, to the land are clear. And the thing is, you know, from the report you have given us, um, the states are not um, doing what they're supposed to do, being the court rules and the inter-American system has already had their, their rules also. And in that regard, more than asking you specific questions, um, I, I, I've been thinking, I was um, talking to, to Margaret, that maybe um, we could do a thematic report just relating to indigenous issues in the Caribbean region, because actually the, the, the issues you're talking about are not um, visibilizados, is the interpreter Indeed. translating? In, uh, they're not visible, visibilized? Visibilized? Visualization? Not visible. Well, not visible. To be made visible. Yeah. To usually, be usually at least yeah. in, in the Latin American region and in, you know, in, Canada down. Usually when you talk about indigenous issues, we either talk about Canada and the United States, or we talk about the Latin American indigenous groups. Mm -hmm. So maybe it would be important yeah. um, focus. To, to focus on the Caribbean region, um, to do a thematic report, mm -hmm. obviously with um, the participation of the, of the indigenous people there, um, and, and with the states, um, 
I think it would be good. We have to see if we have the resources, of course. But um, I'm just thinking out like loud, and maybe funding, yeah. we have to raise funding. Maybe, and maybe, maybe we can yes, help your sister. We can do it <laughs> with the <is> university. <laughs> I don't know, I'm just thinking out loud, but I think it's very important if we, we try to to, to do a, a, a report on the region focused on Caribbean yeah. indigenous groups and um, to visualize more so that the rest of the international community has more information because there's not enough information. Okay, first of all. Secondly, just regarding the specific situations you 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 reported, mm -hmm. maybe as a commission, mm -hmm. we could start but at, by asking, if, um, sending a letter to the states yeah. that are I, I just, compromised. I just wrote that, yes. The letter, the three mechanisms yes. we can use: yes. the thematic, the letter, and press release. Yes. To fo start um, focusing. So I mean, th those are the things that, that uh, I've been thinking about, and I'm sure that the commission, mm -hmm. the rest of the commission, will will be willing mm -hmm. to do it. So mm -hmm. uh, more more than asking specific questions. The idea of, of this is, is that we c you want to, us to do some things, mm -hmm. and um, I think those two actions are very important. And then when we, ha we could see like a visit mm -hmm. um, next year, Yes, we I have. I, th I think. I think. In fact, we have been thinking of a Caribbean yes. visit. Yes. So maybe so we should focus on these countries in the Caribbean um, to go there. First. So I don't know. Um, well, I, I think the rest of the colleagues are going to talk. But the thing mm -hmm. is, I would like to know your opinion about these ideas mm -hmm. we're, we're discussing mm -hmm. right now. Okay. Thank you. I now invite Commissioner Flavio to Thank so interview. Much. Thank you so much for bringing light to an invisible um, theme, I would say, especially in the Caribbean. We, according to our strategic plan, uh, approved it last, last year. We have, uh, as a main priority, to Focus. intensify our relationship with the Caribbean region, especially uh, dealing with indigenous rights. We have a special reporter, who is Antonia, who made um, her intervention. And in the line of our dean, I think we have three different scenarios. Uh, as understood, in the case of Belize, we have the report of the commission of 2004 as a piece, as a tool, right, to promote indigenous rights. And we have the Caribbean Court of Justice, the order, and which is in phase of implementation. So we have a local actor who could help us in this process of implementation. So uh, just thinking about the strategies which could be effective, we have this scenario. Uh, although there is this tension among the executive as understood and the legislative as well, the law is not in accordance with international standards. So we have the judicial branch with us, the executive and the legislative, we have this kind of interinstitutional interinstitutional tension, I would say. In the case of Gua Guyana, it was not clear for me um, the level of compromise of executive, legislative, and judicial uh, branches. And I was, uh, I'd like to ex express my concern um, in regards to the, the, the industries, because we have this agenda, Extractive. business and human rights, mm. and mining, logging, continue to operate almost unchecked in many parts. So there is no monitor, no control. How is the relationship with, of the state regarding those, um, this business, this, this industries, which seem to me they, are, they have no limits, just money, profits, and so I'd like to understand a little bit more. Plus, how is um, legislative, the protection, in terms of legal protection, and if there is this openness regarding judicial, I'd like to understand a little bit of the local actors in the case of Guyana. In the case of Suriname, we have the three Guyana. leading cases. Gu Guyana, no? In the case of Suriname, no, no, because no, no, because there is here. I know it's yeah, there is here. That's why I'm because we have this, uh, yeah, Guyana. Because you mentioned more started Belize and Suriname, but we have some information regarding Guyana, and that's why I'd like to ask for clarification. And in the case of Suriname, we have the three decisions of the Inter-American Court, uh, so we ca we can have the court as our ally, as a system, of course, in the process of implementation. 
So that's mine. Thank you so much. I now um, uh, invite the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression who wishes to intervene and will do so very shortly, very concisely. Thank you, Margaret, and for my English is bit shorter. But everybody is <laughs> No, I, I, I'm glad to do it here and just only to, to know, to have more information uh, for, for you, from you, about the, the threat that you mentioned that the, the indigenous people uh, get because defend the the right to defend the land and the right to defend our the, the rights of the indigenous people. Uh, it's that uh, our office can do uh, follow this situation and, and just uh, and also uh, working in, in the interdependence way with the uh, uh, the, the office of the the, the, right, the reporter of indigenous people to to follow this situation. And thank you. Um, if, if I could just um, say, um, uh, wh whilst I was a judge at the court, we, we did work on cases from Suriname, um, specifically, um, and um, they were quite in, in, informative. I understand that they are still monitoring the Sar Saramaka and the Saramaku um, mm -hmm. cases and so on, um, um, which I sat on, and um, also, the, the, we worked closely with the CCJ, the Caribbean Court of Justice. We had a collaborative, uh, not formal, we were supposed to make it formal, but never got around to it whilst I was there. I think they're still pursuing that. And in relation to the commission, we are, well, I am, as the rapporteur uh, um, on uh, persons of Afro-descendant um, rights, and, and also, against discrimination, um, because this is all discriminatory. Uh, um, um, we, I am working with uh, one of the staff members uh, uh, who is working on Caribbean to make a formal collaborative relationship with the Caribbean Court of Justice. And, and also, I am hoping that in the course of the coming year, I will be able to attend uh, the CARICOM, either foreign ministers meeting or the heads of states meeting and there address the Caribbean states directly. Oh, and this will be one of yeah. the things that we must uh, mm -hmm. address. And um, as I don't know if you know of the uh, Article 41 letter that we can write uh, to request mm -hmm. specific information from states as to specific uh, issues. So that's one of the, the mechanisms that my sister commissioner referred to, so which we will use. Um, I, I'm definitely and completely in favor of this, this, these, these actions that we can take to focus attention. In fact, as the only Caribbean member of the commission, I've been saying, yeah. we have to have the cases of the Caribbean up. We have, to, we have to do more and focus attention because we're hiding behind the cloak of silence, really, uh, most Caribbean countries in this regard. So we, we do have to make particular uh, um, efforts to, to act. Uh, um, in regard to them. I do know there are a couple of cases against Guyana in our system which uh, have passed the merit stage and ought to be uh, um, uh, up for hearing very shortly. Um, so we're hoping to proceed in that regard. But uh, um, the, the egregiousness of the states ignoring decisions of court by which they're bound, including their own national courts, like in Belize, it's, it's, it's unacceptable, which is why we're one of the reasons mm. we, will, uh, we, we will go for the press release, because all that ought to be brought to the public eye. Uh, information is power, and then you could use that as well to assist you in your work. And I would just ask if you will continue to give us inf um, as much information as you can to send all documentation that you have to us, including those maps you spoke about, um, if you could please, uh, because we will pay attention to them, even though others haven't. Um, for that, let me um, give you time to conclude. Um, let me just double check when we're supposed to end. Yes, you, you, yes, you can have 12 minutes.
to make concluding um, statement. Wonderful. I'd like to invite my colleague uh, Pablo Mis, also representing the Maya Leaders Alliance and the Toledo Alcaldes Association, to join me in our response and our mm -hmm. concluding remarks. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much, um, mm -hmm. Christina. Uh, again, uh, thank you to the commission, commissioners, and uh, to the Colorado Law School for hosting this event. Uh, I think I want to I want to conclude by highlighting the question I think that was raised by by Dean and yes. I. Yes. Um, clearly, there are guidelines. Mm -hmm. The orders um, came about mm -hmm. because of intensive evidence, both mm -hmm. oral, mm -hmm. historical, from experts, mm -hmm. to arrive at those decisions. Mm -hmm. The focus we see um, needs to be in terms of putting in place uh, some sort of dialogue perhaps is one of the main, main areas that we see um, where there is a challenge uh, for the parties to come around the table. Um, the case of Belize, as we highlighted clearly, there is a decision. The government is saying, we will implement it. Whether you are with us around the table or not, we will move forward. And that is what makes titling, land titling and demarcation very uh, something to, to monitor in this process because all these evidence that was put forward, the governance of indigenous peoples, the way of life of indigenous peoples is land-based mm -hmm. within the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, so if you proceed in a process of implementing um, titling and demarcation uh, without proper um, dialogue, then we're on the risk of uh, implementing the decisions that have been formed uh, in a way that ultimately erodes the very existence of, of indigenous uh, communities. Um, for us, at least in the experience of the Maya people, we also see that we need to, to ensure that there is a stronger focus within the Caribbean of indigenous peoples. We've looked at the reports, we've tried to also participate in, in events within the Caribbean, and we see that there's very, very little focus on indigenous peoples. The Maya land rights case perhaps is a, a very important um, a stepping stone for the Caribbean region. Um, within Central America, our case doesn't necessarily fit in that region mm -hmm. because we use the laws and the jurisprudence um, under uh, the Caribbean Court of Justice. And uh, we've been working towards uh, formalizing the network of, of indigenous and tribal people of the, the Caribbean. We would be very happy to continue mm -hmm. um, supporting the, the interests of the, the commission to, to strengthen the visibility of indigenous peoples and uh, the voices of indigenous peoples in, in their work. The last comment I wanted to make as well is, while we think of demarcation and, and titling, while we think of these guidelines that have been set in place, another key area has to do with the development of communi communities and their resources, particularly in the area of, in, of, of indigenous economies. Uh, because that's really where we begin to make sense of how do we bridge um, this customary uh, way of our people um, with contemporary um, uh, policies and, 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 and decisions and, and, and laws that exist uh, for, for, for the countries. In the case of the Maya, of the Maya communities, where we are working on what we call the creating Maya economies. Again, while you talk about creating a Maya economy, the issue of tightening property rights comes in, to what extent <coughs> do you begin to, to develop the resources, to what extent does the jurisdiction of, uh, of communities and indigenous peoples fall. Mm -hmm. so, so it's very difficult to talk just about uh, uh, creating a Maya economy without thinking about mm -hmm. uh, the property rights and the demarcation of land and, and resources. Uh, the point I wanted to make there is that while we may want to focus just on titling and demarcation, in order for us to be able to inspire countries and states to, to participate, perhaps we need to begin to look at other, other uh, avenues, such as maybe uh, discussions in terms of economic relationship between indigenous communities and the state, uh, harmonizing the laws that exist, which ultimately will nudge the parties to address the substantive issues, such as uh, the, what, do, what do we mean by the proper property rights of indigenous peoples. Uh, so I just wanted to, to highlight those few things, I think, in our case that uh, we would like to, mm -hmm. to keep um, uh, moving forward, mm -hmm. um, particularly within the context of the Caribbean region. Well, thank you um, 
certainly thank you kindly for uh, allowing us the opportunity again to highlight and um, we are in total agreement with you that the visibility of indigenous people's rights in the Caribbean is um, of utmost importance to us. Um, I wanted to say thank you as well for considering our suggestion for a in-country visit. I think mm -hmm. this would be very useful and to speak specifically to mm -hmm. Professor Anaya's question. Um, I think that this visit <coughs> compounded with your efforts to draw closer to the Caribbean Court of Justice um, could really bring about um, uh, a deeper appreciation for the concerns and challenges that we faced uh, with implementation, uh, specifically because um, the Caribbean Court of Justice, the justices, uh, uh, sadly do not have the, um, the full view of everything that is happening on the ground. Uh, what they hear and what they see are bits and pieces of when we come before them and we mm -hmm. report on these issues. Mm -hmm. But having, having uh, mm -hmm. a body like the Inter-American Commission visit mm -hmm. and, um, and observe and make reports mm -hmm. on their visit, mm -hmm. I think that that would greatly inform um, a, a deeper appreciation of mm -hmm. the challenges and, the, and just the expediency mm -hmm. of the need to really move this, these precedent mm -hmm. case, cases mm -hmm. forward. I also wanted to uh, uh, also uh, appreciate and, and encourage um, Article 41 letter to really make specific a request for um, you know, information on specific things that you're hearing from us through our reports. And uh, finally, I just wanted to um, to say that in terms of the extractive industries and uh, and businesses and human rights challenges, um, the time did not allow, but we've given further uh, uh, detailed reports that mm -hmm. talk about some of these challenges. Yeah. And in the case of Guyana, um, again, we apologize for them not being here to answer directly mm -hmm. uh, for their people, but we will certainly be continuing to work with mm -hmm. the um, APA in uh, allowing them to continue to report, just mm -hmm. as Belize has, to the Commission, mm -hmm. and um, allowing for that information to become more and more visible for the mm -hmm. Caribbean. Mm -hmm. Thank you kindly. So, um, it is uh, now my duty to close this meeting with some um, comments. <clears throat> I just want to reiterate the fact that I, I am from the Caribbean, from Jamaica. We have no indigenous people there because they made sure that they disappeared, all of them, before um, the English state of Jamaica was formed. Um, and yet, I have been in the human rights business, uh, not business, I mean, because I was never part of uh, uh, any staff in, in any organization, but as a volunteer for over 40 years. And um, it has always been part of the concern of uh, the human rights uh, movement, especially the women's movement in, in, in the Jamaica, I can say, because I, I eventually headed both uh, um, Jamaica and Caribbean Association for many years. And, and that we tried to work for uh, um, indigenous people's rights. But one of the things is, even within the Caribbean, there is hardly any knowledge of the way of life of the indigenous people, of, of, of how some of them don't even know they're in their countries and, and that sort of thing. And one thing I wanted to ask, if you could please um, let us know if you haven't already, is um, what po political participation you have in the political structures and bodies within each of these uh, your countries and also in other decision-making levels. Uh, and, and institutions within the country, because that is most important um, that you share in the decision making of the of your 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 respective countries. And in relation to the Article four, 41 letter, you can please send us details of what you want us to address in in them, in relation to the, these countries um, that you found. And let me encourage you to please please join joinder of action is far more powerful than a single yeah. actor. So please try to join all the countries where you have indigenous people in the Caribbean into some cooperative body 
um, that you, you can speak was one voice in relation to pointing out the main issues and rights, then you can deal with your particular um, separate issues, but the main issues, you should cooperate and act together. And um, I'd be assured that we would try everything that we can to assist the process. So I thank all of you here, and thank you, Dean. Dean, we're going to talk to you before we leave here about your <laughs> assistance, the assistance of the university and yourself for the thematic report. <laughs> because we do I'm putting you on. <laughs> and and uh, I thank the members of the public who were here listening, and of course, the um, translators without whom um, the um, hearings will be a bit uh, impossible. Thank you so much for coming and bringing this matter to our attention. Thanks, and this hearing is at an end. <laughs>